starts, you know, it has to, it takes forever to reestablish all those, um, all those methylation marks. Um, so it can have appropriate control over its cellular machinery. So. You can't inherit an acquired trait. This is one of my favorites. Because um, this is, again, things I was just talking about epigenetics. Um, so you were taught for years and years and years, of course, that the only thing that mattered was your genes. Uh, and that what your parents had at birth was what you were going to inherit. Um, that nothing that happened during your parents' lifetime was a thing that could be inherited by you, other than things like mutations. Um, that, you know, your parents' life experiences really didn't matter. Um, that's, that's been the, like one of the core thoughts about evolutionary biology for, you know, many, many decades now. Um, so this is what we were taught, of course, which is egg meets sperm, the chromosome mixes, for relations complete, you get magic, new, happy, like um, yeah. But, uh, and that what makes up, what, what will determine what that child or that individual is like, is entirely encoded in their genes, in, their, in the actual coding structure of their genes. Um, but again, I'm going to try and keep this science really, really simple, but this was one of the first really important experiments about um, inherited acquired traits, um, where we dealt with, um, uh, primarily with rats, because uh, we do all kinds of fun things to rats. When we, <laughs> uh, genetic research is all about being mean to rats. Uh, if they bitten you like eight times, you stop caring. <laughs> so one of the cool things that <laughs> I, I, I have committed rap genocide now. That's all I'm <laughs> Mouse genocide too. Uh, <laughs> I, my karma will never be clean from all of my research. Um, so this was an experiment done roughly 10 years ago now, I think, maybe eight. Um, involving um, attentive and inattentive mothers and rats, um, where uh, you had the pups who were... Uh, so the idea here is that it has to do with how you inherit methylation um, and whether or not that comes from experiences and all of that. Um, so as your sort of control experiment, you took very attentive mothers and, and, their, and their babies and um, your inattentive mothers and babies, and you looked at their brains, and we did, we did in fact, pull their brains out. Uh, <laughs> sorry, genetics research is kind of me. Um, and looked for the methylation in the genomes in their brain. Um, and uh, the pups that had um, attentive mothers had much lower methylation, and the pups that had more, that had a lot more inattentive mothers and therefore more stress had much higher methylation. Um, so, if that methylation notice was something that were inherited, you would expect that that would not change if you invert those pups. Uh, but in the second experiment, when you take uh, the pups that were actually the biological children of the uh, attentive mother, sorry, the inattentive mother, and give them to the attentive mother and vice versa, um, and then again examine their brains, um, you'll find that again the methylation stays the same. Uh, that the pups that were raised by um, Attentive mothers still have low methylation and there's not have sorry, I'm like eight million hands up, so three. <laughs> oh that, no, it's okay. Okay. Um do you, is there any research on when that methylation happens? Like if you switch them at birth versus one week versus um, two months. It, it there's a little bit. Um it tends to be a relatively continuous process. Okay. Uh so um, and really is something that's pretty relevant to the all the time. Oh, though there are some interesting things with humans, uh, some interesting studies about the effects of trauma uh, on methylation in the brain. Um, but then there's some research already too, because we're not allowed to cut out people's brains until they're dead. Um, my research would have been so much easier if I could just cut out people's brains. Um, <laughs> 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 oh, no, no, I just don't have to look at their blood. It's way harder. I hope to answer that question. There are critical periods. Right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we have another biologist in the room. Evolutionary psychologist. Okay. Well, we the dreaded yes. evolutionary psychologist. This is so exciting. Uh, this is going to be a really whoa question here. Um, so does that mean that like the rat babies act like the mom that raises them? Yes. So, all right. So say that you took it down another generation, the babies of the inattentive mother would also be inattentive mothers. 
correct. Okay. Exactly. That was going to be my question. Well, wouldn't that mean that they're a product of their environment? Exactly. But that, but that's not something we've ever that, that not been established biologically. Um, if that makes sense. It's always been in the psychological. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's been established in the psychological behavior. It's actually found in the means that a, a biological mechanism. So, so the whole nature it, versus nurture is actually yeah. all one. It, 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 it is, is nurture. <laughs> so, so in this case, it's uh, say replicating a. Uh, a behavioral thing with a biological experiment. Right. So, so has this had like huge implica implications to like, I mean, how much do we know about this stuff? Is it still just the it's, We are still really, really early. On. Although there's some really cool research, actually, a friend, uh, a colleague of mine, who's been finishing up a PhD, um, did some has done some really cool research, actually, about methylation marks um, in uh, in, vitro, in vitro fertilization in uh, adult in humans, um, and actually. Children who are conceived by in vitro fertilization have very different methylation profiles in many of their tissues um, than those who are conceived in more uh, conventional senses. Um, and she's trying to correlate that back to disease states, whether or not certain diseases um, are correlated to these, those methylation states. So, uh, yeah, methylation is actually a really sort of crazy thing that we're, we're still uh, very much in the infancy of learning how it works and how, it, um, and how it's inherited. Is there any idea of how many generations that can affect down? Um, it's been proven up to three generations, at least in mice. Um, in humans, it's still, we're still, I mean, this work in humans is still very much in Still it. waiting for the brain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, as soon as we can start to, like, just people can set to live brain samples, my life will get so much easier. So, I have 10 minutes left, and I want to give you guys a chance to answer, ask questions, so I'm going to move on. Um, so one trait, one disease is again a really fun one. Um, so this is one I, I personally definitely remember from from my like eighth grade and, and my grade science classes, which is this idea that like every trait in an individual is contro controlled by one you know one trait and one gene. So your hair color is controlled by one gene, your eye color is controlled by one gene, your skin color is controlled by one gene, your feet size is controlled by one gene, your height is controlled by one gene. Um, Especially before the you know the, in the days before the genome human genome project was anywhere near completion, this really was how things were thought. You know that there was a specific gene for diabetes. There was a specific gene for um, scleroderma for you know all kinds of you know, human diseases that would you think you that made you susceptible to the environmental factor that triggered it or simply caused the disease. Um, <coughs> and that really was the, like I, I mean I. These things are, and this is still relatively new information, um, but that really was, you know, that wasn't just a sort of eighth grade science dumbing down, that is actually what was thought by the field until um, 15, 15 you know, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, so this is what you probably think and we're probably taught, um, that every gene controls one trait or disease and then every disease is caused by one gene. Um, it has to do with the one gene, one protein situation. Um, so everyone kind of thought for years that well, you know, one protein probably, you know, is responsible for so many of these, you know, the human processes. But, oops, what's actually going on looks a lot more like this. <laughs> um, this is not super new. This is, this is actually from three years ago, because they haven't made a new one yet. Um, but this is um, a summary of all of what are known as the genome-wide association studies that have been published um, as of the end of 2012. Um, do you know why association studies are, are really cool, very, very, very expensive uh, genetic studies where we uh, uh, collect a bunch of demographic information, um, personal and health information from people, and then we either sequence their exomes uh, or their genomes. Uh, and then we look to see in using all kinds of really fun math tricks uh, and really expensive computer systems. Um, yay, supercomputers. Um, <laughs> to figure out uh, which of those variants actually correlate to um, specific diseases or traits. Uh, and as you can see, um, we found a lot of stuff. Uh, so as it turns out, say, uh, we've identified something like, I think 26 genes that are involved in human height. Um, and so far that only accounts for like, <coughs> 27%, 30% of human variation in height. So we're not even 
scratch the surface of any ways. Um, we've discovered like 68 genes involved in diabetes. Uh, we've, we've discovered 135 genes involved in autism. Um, the long story of like sort of the last five years of genetics has been that holy shit, genetics is way more complicated than we ever thought. <laughs> um, like every time we thought, you know, so close to really understanding this, and we're going to get it, and we're going to make all these advances, and then we do the research, and we're like, holy shit, we were so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Like, there is so much more to know, oh my god, and what, you know, how far does the rabbit hole go? And we really don't know. We don't know how far the rabbit hole goes in genetics. Um, but we're getting there because, yay, whole genome sequencing. Um, that was an era of the thousand dollar genome. Uh, so, as it turns out, there are actually very, very few single, like, single gene traits and very, very few single trait diseases. So we've actually now, actually, yeah, we're actually too much. Um, you can actually divide, um, in a genetic sense, um, diseases between what we call uh, complex diseases or complex illnesses or um, multifocal um, illnesses um, and what we call Mendelian uh, diseases. So um, there are actually only like 230 Mendelian conditions, um, which are diseases that are controlled by a single gene or maybe just one or two genes. Um, and those are things like cystic fibrosis, um, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, Tay Sachs, um, all the all the lysosomal like, storage, storage diseases, all the inborn errors, metabolism, things like that. Um, there aren't that many of them, and they're all actually super rare. Thank goodness. Um, but those diseases actually end up being uh, easier to treat in many ways because we know the gene that causes them, so we can figure out how that gene works. We can figure out how the protein involved in it works, and we can find a way to manipulate that. Uh, we've made huge advances in cystic fibrosis research in just the last four or five years because we finally figured out how the CFCR um, transporter, which is a chloride transporter, actually works. And we found ways to modify it in the broken ones that are made in uh, cystic fibrosis patients. So we have some really awesome promising new treatments uh, based on actually the specific genetic makeup of every individual um, CF patient. Sorry, what's the word you used to describe those? Um, Mendelian. Oh, so, sorry, I yeah, <laughs> Mendelian genetics and Mendelian conditions. Um, so, uh, but as it turns out, things like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, um, kidney, kidney disease, all of those things are far more complicated than we could ever hope. Um, and we're not quite to the point where we can actually profile someone to figure out why they got diabetes or why they got cancer. Um, but we're getting better with cancer. We're getting there. Uh, we can actually afford to sequence really rare cancers and be like, oh, it was caused by like these four mutations, so let's use this specific compound to treat them. Um, that's the really cool thing about this whole like personalized medicine uh, frontier that we've been talking about for 15 years now that we're just finally starting to get a little bit of. Um, I think we're still 10 years away from it being really useful for them in like specific cancers. But so what do you mean, like manufacturing medicines for individuals? Mm -hmm. oh. um, like profiling a cancer um, and knowing exactly which compounds we can treat, uh, treat it with, whether using inhibitor therapy and things like that. Oh. Um, cool. <clears throat> you know, we we had some really awesome early, early successes with things like Leibach, um, which we which is used to treat um, uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Uh, it was actually the first cancer ever discovered that we uh, had a single gene cause for, so it was really easy to discover an inhibitor uh, for that protein, and it turns out it basically gives you a lifetime control over that cancer until it mutates <laughs> and becomes mute to that. But um, it went from a cancer that, that killed people in three or four years to something people live with for 30 or 40 years nowadays. It's turned it from a very serious illness into something that's actually chronic, you know, a chronic but treatable condition. Um, you know, I, I had a patient when I was with the University of Michigan that I think had been on inhibitors for like 21 or 22 years. She was on her like third inhibitor and still kicking, like still just very healthy, just you know, watched her counts and checked her, her genetics all the time. And um, so there, these things are actually, you know, good things are coming. It's just, I think we're still, you know, a few years out before this really affects people in the sort of the larger sense. Ah, there are seven, genomic complexity. Oh wow, I'm really close on time. I'm so sorry. Um, genomic complexity. So, um, what you were probably taught is that because humans are the most complex organism, we therefore probably have the most complex genome. <laughs> no, 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 you've been close. Um, <laughs> so,
So, um, let's see. There we go. So, there we are with mammals. Um, <coughs> and as it turns out, things like amphibians, insects, mollusks, which are actually biologically considerably more simple than we are, often have orders of magnitude larger genomes than us. We don't really know why. Uh, <laughs> it's still known as largely a biological paradox, though. Um, again, there's, there's some interesting things about lung coding RNA that I won't preach to you today. Uh, but yeah, the largest animal genome is, is, is the lungfish, which is roughly like more than 10 times the size of our genome. <laughs> Those things are crazy weird, though. They are crazy <laughs> weird, <laughs> but... Uh, and there's a, there's a Japanese flowering plant that is a 150 uh, based genome. So. Uh, okay, ah, I did get to the end, so I have like two minutes to answer questions. <laughs> I made it in time though, I'm so happy. Okay. That uh, measure that you gave uh, in there, was that giga base pairs or giga bytes? Like giga base pairs. All right, I was, what, um, if there's a, I was wondering exactly in terms of information content, um, if you know how many bits are in a genome, when you take in the, epigenet, the, gen, the epigenetic factors like the, um, uh, methylation and so forth. How much does that add to uh, the information content? Uh, it doubles uh, it. Multi it multiple it multiplicatively. Or, um, basically, um, the, the sum of the, the methylation information um, in the cell is, is equivalent so, to another whole genome on top of the actual genome. Sequence. All right. So that's the figure it would be like a multiple or a magnitude number of genomes. Yeah. Uh, depending on how, how much of that data you're looking at. Yeah, if you're looking at just methylation, then no, but if you're looking at methylation, you still mark, et cetera, then you start adding each of those is one another, you know. Right, that's what I was wondering exactly how many layers of that we've done so far. So many. <laughs> so, Thank you so much for using my Sorry. mind on uh, something. My, my grandmother died from the effects of polycystic kidney disease, and I was told that it is autosomal dominant. So for the longest time, I was freaked out. That I'm going to get it, no questions asked. But just knowing that a lot of diseases are more complex. Um, than that. You should definitely see a genetic counselor about that, though. I'm going to, uh, I'm not a genetic counselor, I'm a laboratory geneticist, so I'm not going to be like, don't take anything I'm saying. Is, is, well, I don't uh, plan to read Okay, so. okay. <laughs> um, but if that's the thing you're going to be really like, you do have awesome specialists who can specialize in okay. talking to you about that. So genetic counseling is an awesome thing. So how fast or much does your genetic information? or changes of information from your environment over your life is something that, like changing events, but of course, this, you're, you're, you have to adapt to your environment. We're, we're still figuring out in a lot of ways uh, how much of that has to be a you know, permanent change versus temporary changes to deal with specific environmental uh, triggers. So it's temporary ones. What's that? So it's temporary ones, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, once, once DNA is methylated, it can become demethylated. Um, and that there are processes to, you know, to, to add and remove the population marks all the time. Um, you tend to accumulate them as you age only because um, there's a lot more processes to methylate DNA than to feed them, but it, they do operate in multiple ways. I can't hear the question. <coughs> Are there known differences between the yes. methylation of male and female young? Um, that's okay. That, that's more complicated than I can actually like get into right off the bat because there's a whole process called uh, methylation stripping. Um, there's printing that is. If you really want to learn about how all that works. Um, Google genetic imprinting uh, or, or epigenetic imprinting, um, and you'll get a bunch of really cool information about how that process actually works. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I am now out of time. I wish I could answer more of your questions, but thank you guys for being an awesome attendant audience.